after, uh, after Blair, I went to Gettysburg College for 2.9 years. My college career imploded. I got in a van and went to California. Ended up on a commune for a couple of years, which was something I wouldn't trade for anything. Came uh, uh, wobbling back to the East Coast with my tail between the lights. And that's right, a night in the ditch with your brother. Yes, yeah, so we're not going there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that could take up a whole, a whole hour. So I got, I got back to the Lehigh Valley and, and I uh, opened a little art gallery and I tried to have exhibits. I called uh, Robert Atkinson and, I, and he said, well, come up from there and have an exhibit for the art class. And I did. And Robert Atkinson, Bob Atkinson was old school, if you know what I mean. And, this, and the students were not exactly old school at that time, uh, 1972, 73. And uh, he was having a lot of trouble uh, in the class. They didn't like his style. And he saw that I was connecting to the students more. And so uh, he said, maybe I can hire you as my assistant. I didn't have a college degree. Um, but it didn't seem to matter for Blair at the time. So we went to Jim, Jim Howard and, and he said, I'd like to hire the folk to uh, come in. And Jim said, we know Jim, Mr. Howard. <laughs> Remember, he had eyes that were sunk in his head about two inches deep. And, and he said, we don't have any money to pay him. And he said, well, you know, I got a little much money in my budget. And they worked it out and it was $15 every two weeks. <laughs> I swear. Yeah. But I got room and board, moved into your apartment, and when you got married and moved to Millbrook, and I, and I came here and it kind of uh, rescued my career from oblivion. I had no career. I had no degree. And, uh, and, and so, worked for a year here at Blair, and I got a job because of Laird Carlson, who was an English teacher here, and he had gone to Stowe School in Stowe, Vermont. And he was my buddy because he liked instruments. He liked uh, cellos and viola and gambas and things. And, and we stayed in touch. And he said, there's the uh, head of the art department at Stowe School uh, opening up. And, and uh, I eventually got that job. And it kind of led me uh, on an upward career path. Well, the reason I'm telling you this is I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I had to drive uh, to Blair back and forth. And I, I threw the little town of Nazareth. That's why I played you this song, Bolton of Nazareth. So, on the way from Bethlehem to Blairstown, Mark Guitar, Bill Board, come take the factory tour. Took the factory tour, I couldn't believe it. In my own area, the, the best acoustic guitars in the world were being made. And uh, uh, I finished the tour. I was flabbergasted and I went to the receptionist doing her nails and, and I said, uh, any scrap woods? And uh, she said, one of the dumpster around the side of the building. And I drove my Mustang around and I hit the jackpot. And the dumpster was filled with rosewood and mahogany and spruce and ebony and koa wood from Hawaii. And I filled my car up and I came back an hour later and I filled my car up again. <laughs> and I brought the wood up to Blair to the wood shop that we're standing on somewhere. It was a basement of, I think it was a filled-in swimming pool in the basement of East Hall. And I can't believe they let me uh, teach woodworking with power tools to these kids who were probably on LSD. But, <laughs> and uh, so I gradually, uh, you know, kept going back. I went back to the dumpster probably 500 times. Seriously. I started getting good pieces and the, the foreman at the back door got to know me and he called me the kid. They're all Pennsylvania Dutch. You know? And, he, and uh, one day I'm in the dumpster and I, had, I still had my afro. <laughs> picture of that. And he said, well, what are you doing stuff anyhow? <laughs> and I had two instruments, kind of rudimentary. You can attest to that. And, and, uh, I handed him up and he said, do you mind if I parade him around the shop once? And off he went with my two instruments and he ran into Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin was eight, 85 years old and walked around the shop like this. But he was wonderful, a wonderful man. And he looked at the instruments and he said, tell that kid to apply for a job. So Harvey 
get back to the back door. It says, the old man says you should apply for a job. C-H-O-B. And, and so I brushed off best I could, and I went around to the front, and, and the same receptionist still doing her nails. And I said, I'd like to apply for a job. She said, I don't think we have anything for you. And uh, she'd been like trained to avoid people like me. And I, and I said, well, any openings? One opening, design drafting. So I've been doing design drafting for 10 years with Bob Atkinson. And I've been teaching design drafting for four years, and, and I was in the car. She said, we're really looking for somebody with experience with woodworking. I said, well, you know, I've been making jewelry boxes and lathe turnings and furniture with your materials. I have some in the car. She said, we're really looking for somebody that has experience with musical instruments. And I said, the old man said that I should apply for a job. So, Reluctantly, they, they brought uh, human res personnel. They brought personnel up and, and they uh, interviewed me and they, they said, well, can you start tomorrow? I said, no, I have to go to the Bob Dylan concert. <laughs> start on Wednesday. So, I was, I was fortunate to have a, a really amazing 42-year career. I started in drafting and, and uh, design and all different things and I ended up in running the advertising department where I got uh, a phone call from uh, somebody that had seen Eric Clapton MTV Unplugged uh, performance that he won some all the Grammy Awards for. And they wanted to know what he was playing and where they could get one. And, and I got a, a second and a third and a fourth and 50 phone calls. And after 50 phone calls I went to Chris Martin, my boss. I said, I got a lot of calls, can I contact Eric Clapton? We didn't do any artist involvement. She said, you can contact Clapton as long as it's charity. That's what I did. The next day, I got an uh, email back that Eric was thrilled about it, and we did an incredible project that led my career into artist relations and to 20-some uh, years of um, collaborating with 140 different musicians, from Tom Petty to Crosby, Stills and Nash, and every, well, anybody you can think of. So, I, I uh, played this song because uh, I worked with Robbie Robertson um, a number of years ago, and, and I said, you know, something's bugging us here about this Gold of Nazareth thing. Could you explain that? And he said, well, people think it's a biblical reference or something, but uh, in fact, uh, he was up at Big Pink writing the song The Wait, who was uh, an easy writer. And he had, a, he had the tune in his head, but he, and he had a legal pad, but he didn't have any lyrics. And he started to write, I pulled into, and he said he didn't know where he was pulling into. And he just sat there for five minutes blank, looked into the inside through the sound roll of his guitar and saw Nazareth PA. And he said, pulled into Nazareth, and he said the rest of the song wrote itself in five minutes. So it was a good story, and we, we made a, made a great collaboration with Robbie. I hope you can see this. Uh, is it showing up clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a beautiful piece of color that I got from the dumpster. <laughs> so the way the way this would work is uh, uh, often we didn't really want to honor guitar players that played other brands, and we didn't want to steal them away. But there's so many of the people that play Martin. Guitars, we wanted to pay tribute to the people that actually played the instruments. So I thought what I would do today is just uh, go through a couple of stories. So uh, Merle Haggard, a uh, big fan of Jimmy Rogers, and uh, uh, he was coming through, uh, he was going to be coming through our area, and he wanted to talk about it, and we thought it was a good idea. And so he said, um, you know, give me, your phone, give me your home phone number, I'll call you when I'm in town. So, 3 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. Hello? This is Merle. We're down to the, we're down to the Nazareth diner. And uh, come on down and have some crap with us. So, uh, that, that's... Wow. Uh, so this was at, uh, out in California when we completed his, his model. And Jimmy Rogers, the, the, the guitar that Jimmy Rogers played was really a famous guitar. It had thanks on the back. 
He used to play at railroad stations. He would flip the, after he played on the platform, he would flip the guitar up and, and everybody would go crazy. So we, we had to have that on the back of Merle's guitar. So it's really appropriate to talk about John Sebastian, and I've probably heard the same story from 15 people, uh, v various versions of the John Sebastian mythology. Uh, the, the interesting thing, I didn't, no, I didn't go to school with John. John was five years before us, I believe. And uh, Mark Sebastian was, in fact, here when, when I was a prefect in Lock Hall with Bob Stutter, which was, I have to tell you, was not a pleasant experience. So uh, he was a wrestler, you know, and he practiced on me. <laughs> Good wrestler, yeah. So he, this is a priceless photograph of John Sebastian. On, uh, I think he's on the porch of Inslee. Uh, is that West Hall was a cornflake spot, and he's got a nice little group cut. So these photos are courtesy of Bart Sebastian. I have been friends with both of them for many, many years. And uh, John, in fact, did graduate. But there's a, a shot of him with a, a Gibson guitar. I'm allowed to say that now because I'm retired. <laughs> I don't know who the guy is with him, but John played a lot of music here uh, at Blair. And these are very, very rare uh, photographs that I'm not sure John would appreciate me showing you. So there's a, a picture of John Sebastian with Bob Dylan. Uh, I, took, I, I took a shot of uh, a, a little photograph that he had on his desk. He really, he really got around. Uh, here he is with George Harrison. He was working with uh, Jimi Hendrix as well on a, on a number of songs when Jimi Hendrix passed away. So I brought John here for a concert. I don't know if any, anybody would remember this, but I put a concert on in uh, what was Memorial Hall, and uh, it was quite a concert. Uh, John, John's problem with Blair was that, that uh, he got caught on the girl. Um, got caught on the golf course with his girlfriend in a precarious position. And, uh, and punishment for that was they took his guitar away. And, and uh, it wasn't a good thing to do. They, they should have done something else because he said, if I ever make a penny playing music, I'm not giving any of it to Blair. Well, that turned out to be true. But we did, he did have a tremendous love for Ferd Marcial. And he had a, and Johnny Marcial and, and Matt Jameson and a number of people, locals to the town, were, were close with John. And he, so he came back and did the concert at Memorial Hall, pretty much uh, for first. And I made a poster, and on the poster, uh, John Sebastian, and I spelled it wrong. And, and, and he never let me get over it. So this ran in the, in the newspaper, and. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah. So he went. Uh, he came to visit me at, at my Church of Art in Nazareth, PA, and he and you know he offered to uh, record my on hold music, and he said, "Hi, this is John Sebastian. I'm here at Dick Book's house in Nazareth, PA, visiting the Morton Guitar Company." And he went on and on, and and, and this this. Uh, plays a pretty significant part in, in what followed. So, you know, we became friends over the years. This is, he, John was inspired by Mississippi John Hurt, uh, and this is actually a little shrine in John's house in his library, uh, a little shrine to Mississippi John Hurt. That's where Love and Spoonful comes from. That Love and Spoonful. So, this is a picture of John uh, from the back of the Woodstock album, you might recognize this. And if you look at the headstock of that guitar, this is a Gibson, this is a Gibson guitar. So the, the story is in 1930, there goes the mic, <laughs> microphone. In 1930, um, Gibson saw that Martin had invented a new shape of guitar called the Dreadnought, and that we were, that Martin was having success with it. And, and so, they, uh, they copied it, 
without our permission, they copied our guitar, and we called it the 12 uh, Slope Shoulder Dreadnought. And uh, we didn't appreciate it, but Martin was not a litigating company. We're pretty good, uh, pretty good citizens, especially Mr. Martin that hired me. He was a good guy. So we kind of let it go for 70 or 80 years. And uh, uh, my boss, Chris Martin, decided to finally steal it back from me. So we stole Gibson's version of their copy of our guitar. We stole it back. And we made a couple of prototypes. And John found out about it. And he was curious, because he always subscribed to that type of guitar. He came down to Martin, and, and I showed him uh, one of the guitars. And so we, we designed a, a signature model uh, based on uh, his wishes for the guitar. And instead of uh, Martin, he wanted to say Morton. <laughs> on the label, he wanted to say Nosereth, and he wanted my signature to be Dick Book. <laughs> you know, it's great to have little hooks. The other thing is the inlays in the fingerboard of John's guitar were based on Mississippi John Hurt's original inlays on his guitar. So it, it, it's really fun to uh, kind of embed all of the stories into an, into an instrument. And of course, it has to be, it has to be a great instrument too. That's the label, by the way, and that was the, that was the uh, artwork from Thomas Sutra Records. And mm -hmm. all of the Love and Spoonful's music was on Thomas Sutra. Um, and there's John and I with his dog, Shuggy, uh, in Woodstock, New York. And I, I see John every, uh, every year, at least once a year, up in Woodstock. And he's just a, he's a great, great individual. So this is a kind of a fun story. I, 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 uh, because of the, the initial phone call and, and, and uh, replicating Eric Clapton's 1939 Mark guitar that he's holding there, we uh, re reintroduced a guitar model that, that uh, hadn't been offered for quite a long time. And there was pent up demand for it. The thing about Clapton's guitars is they they have shorter they have shorter string length, which means you can bend the notes more. And Clapton liked that because they were more expressive. The longer string length it was more projective, but the shorter length you could really bend the notes. So. Everybody wanted one of these, and we did a limited edition. And I was looking for the right number, and I, I picked 461 for 461 Ocean Boulevard, which was his comeback album. And the entire edition, $7,500 per guitar, sold out in 20 minutes at the, at the trade show. And so the sales manager came up to me and put his arm around me and said, what are we going to do next? <laughs> you know, he had fought me the whole way on <laughs> Nobody will buy a $7,000 guitar. Those guitars are now worth about $15,000. They were one of the nicest guitars. But it led to uh, 11 different projects over the years with Eric Clapton. And we're, uh, project, we're uh, suggesting a 12th project now. Uh, a couple of different shots of Eric through different uh, incarnations and different guitar projects that I worked on and with. This, was, this guitar is called the Poor Man's Clap, and it's only three and a half thousand. So these are built with, with a tremendous sensitivity to his uh, desires. If, if you can satisfy our Clapton with a guitar, you can be sure that if you make more of them, uh, and by the way, we sold 40,000 of the Poor Man's Clap to date. That's enough to pay my salary for <laughs> This is a, called the Black Beauty or the Balletzenera. Uh, this is one of the, uh, from one of his album covers. And uh, this was taken at the Albert Hall. Uh, that's my wife and, and Chris Martin next to Eric. Disheveled Eric, as I call this. Uh, this was at the very tail end of his alcohol problem. And he was... Uh, scheduled to go on at 8 o'clock, and this photograph was taken at 7.53. He said, come on now, I've got to go on. And uh, on he did. This was uh, not a pleasant situation, and what I learned about Eric in this situation is 
that he doesn't like to be commercialized, and he doesn't like to be photographed, and he doesn't like all those shows. He's great. One-on-one -on -one with you, he's fabulous. In, in a situation where there's bright lights and cameras and people that want his autographs, he's not a happy camera. So after you learn that, then everything gets real good. So, uh, John Mayer came to us uh, at uh, barely 20 years old, right at the very beginning of his career, before his album, Run for Squares. And uh, his management had told us that uh, he's going to be the next best thing. And, and you know, uh, how many people don't like John Mayer? <laughs> you know, I, I constantly run into people that think John Mayer is, is uh, something that he isn't. But he's magnificent. He's a magnificent guitar player, he's a great songwriter, he's a fantastic singer, he's a, he's a comedian, he's a tremendous personality. And uh, because he's in the tabloids, he gets, he's got a little bit of a back and back over the years. He also has a big mouth and he says stupid things sometimes. But he's, he's magnificent and had a, just a phenomenal time working with him. There he is uh, in Laurel Canyon, California. This being the, the fourth project that I did with him. This is called the Stagecoach Guitar. And he wanted a guitar that was uh, based on the instruments that Martin made in the 1870s and 80s uh, that would have been delivered by Stagecoach. Um, and this was at John's 30th birthday party. And I donated a guitar and had all the people that came to the, the party sign it. Uh, including Tony Bennett, who sang, uh, sang for the concert. And, and this was a very special event. And this is at John's house uh, in uh, Livingston, Montana, with my family. You know, it's one of the nice perks of uh, getting lucky and finding a job that you love. So this, was, this is the story here. So when Katrina happened, um, Eric was recording in Los Angeles, and he had actually just finished recording, and he sent, he sent his guitar tech and all of his equipment back to London on a plane. And he was spending a couple days in Los Angeles before flying back, and he got a call from Larry King that Katrina, you know, they needed to do a benefit, and would Eric consider coming on the show in New York City? Uh, Eric agreed to do it, but he didn't have a guitar. And he called me on the phone and he said, I'm going to be at the line. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, was, uh, it was Saturday morning and, and uh, Martin was closed. I couldn't go in and get any guitars. I just happened to have 50 or 60 uh, upstairs in my little room, a couple, including three puppet models. So I, I said, well, you know, I, I, I have a guitar for you. When do you need it? And he said, well, could you drive it? Start driving now, I'm getting on the plane, and I'll meet you at the Four Seasons Hotel on floor number 16, which is his floor. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got a guitar ready, and 15 minutes later I got a call from John Mayer, and I've just gotten off the phone with Eric, and he's invited me to play with him on the Larry King show, and I don't have a guitar either. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you know what a guitar tech is. A guitar tech is the person that rich, rich guitarists hire to, to tune their guitars and hand them, hand them to them. And it's actually quite a skill to be a guitar tech, and I didn't really realize that. Uh, but they asked me if I would guitar tech for them. And so I got all my strings, and I got a bunch of guitars, and I got my car, and I drove to the Four Seasons. And I'm in the room with Eric and, and John, and, and uh, they're playing the guitars, and, and Eric says, you didn't stretch the strings out. <laughs> Were you supposed to stretch them out like a bow and arrow, and then flip them back, and then tune them again, and stretch them again? And, and so that was my first faux pas. But, uh, so they're, uh, they're playing guitar, and I, and I have a third guitar, and this is my chance. <laughs> I play with Eric Clapton and John Mayer. So uh, I'm, playing, I'm kind of playing leads along, and Eric, Eric looks over at me and he says, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're, they're over in the corner, and, and they're working 
on the song, and Eric's doing it with his fingers, you know, like like uh, Earl Travis or Chet Atkins. And John has a pick, and he's doing this, and Eric says, no, 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 no. He said, uh, you know, do it like this. And, and John said, I don't do that country stuff. You know? And Eric got pissed off. And he said, get over here. I'm teaching this. So he, he taught him how to do the little finger style thing. And reluctantly, John kind of, you know, he got he learned it in like two seconds. And, and they did a great job. And I, I'm actually sitting about three feet to the right of John Mayer on the school. So it was a fantastic thing, and they raised you know, half a million dollars just in, in that 15 years. So um, um, John went back and, and he said, I'm going to show Eric Clapton that I can really do this. So he wrote a song called Stop This Train. And it's a great song. It uses a little finger style technique that Eric had taught him. <coughs> and John was doing it on tour in, in England and, and Eric invited him to stay at his house. And, and Eric took him up to the bedroom and, and it was Layla's bedroom, Patty Boy's bedroom. And John thought that was a little weird. <laughs> and it, after dinner, he, he grabbed a guitar and said, I'd like to show you the song that I wrote. And he went, dare, 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 you know, played the little finger style, and Eric said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> went on to sell like seven million copies. <laughs> So I don't want to paint Eric Clapton as like this negative person, but uh, uh, he's his so this was pretty special. So Andy Griffith on the Andy Griffith show playing a guitar, you know, uh, you be a and I were pulling on me, and uh, we all grew up with that and Matlock and everything. He's always has has a guitar with Barney and everything, and Obi and and Davis. And I've been trying to figure out what guitar it was because it didn't look right. So uh, it didn't have a it didn't have a pick guard, which is very very unusual. It also had no logo on the headstock, and I couldn't understand. I tried for several years to get in touch with them, and finally uh, the Morris Agency in Los Angeles uh, apparently was representing him. And I made a call, just kind of a cold call, and I said, uh, "Is Andy there?" You know, I said crazy. And, and they, they put me through to this guy that, that handles his account. And I explained who I was and, and what we wanted to find out. Uh, and uh, he said, okay, I'll see what I can do. And next day I got a phone call. He said, this is Andy. And I said, this is Barney. <laughs> and he said, I have a story for you. And he, he said, you know, he was in a, uh, there was a filmmaker called Ilya Kazan. And this is during the McCarthy hearings when uh, communists and everything. Uh, so Ilya Kazan got blackballed uh, in the middle. You probably know the story better than I do, but uh, Ilya Kazan ratted out on a number of his uh, filmmaking compatriots. And the result was that he got blackballed in the industry right in the middle of a movie that he was making with uh, Andy Griffith, which turns out to be one of, I think, one of the greatest movies, uh, certainly that Andy Kazan ever made, and possibly one of the most intense movies you'll ever see, called The Face in the Crowd. That's if you haven't seen The Face in the Crowd, you've got to go see it. It's Andy's crowning role. So he plays a hillbilly that comes up out of the uh, out of the woods of the Ozarks or something, becomes popular in the local radio, becomes popular in the county and then in the state and then he becomes a national television star and as his career progresses he becomes more and more despicable until everything implodes at the end and, and it's just a remarkable intense story. They figured as he became a star he needs to have, he has a crummy little guitar when he starts and he's got to have a Martin guitar when he finishes so the prop master went and bought a Martin guitar out on the street and brought it back Ilya Kazan said, I want you to paint it black with house paint, sprinkle sequins into it and glitter, and spell mama on the front and lonesome roads on the back. And the prop master did all this, uh, effectively ruining the instrument, and, and very proudly showing it to Andy, and Andy said, what are you doing to this instrument? You know, and he was so angry. So, after the movie was over, the, uh, and the, Andy's telling me all this. You know, uh, 
he said the prop room door was open and there was a, the guitar case was sitting there and I, and I looked around and, and I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and he took it back to his apartment and can you imagine Andy Griffith living in New York City? But he, he, was, uh, he was there and he was a comedian, he'd done a comedy album. Uh, and uh, he said he went down to the, to the hardware store and he bought a pack of sand, assorted grit sandpaper and he spent, and I spent seven days sanding all the black, and he sanded all the black off it. And in the process the decal came off and the, and the pick guard came off and it was all down to, the, down to the wood and he didn't know what to do with it. And so he took it down on the street and uh, he walked up and down looking for a guitar shop and he found a, little, a guy with a little shop apron and a little guitar making studio and he took it in and the guy said, yeah, yeah I can put the lacquer back on. And, uh, and, and uh, he said, do you want a picker? I don't want no picker. You want a decal? I don't want no decal. Just want him up, just put the lacquer back on. So he put the lacquer on, it cost him 40 bucks. And that was John D'Angelico perhaps the greatest, most famous guitar, guitar maker of all of America, you know, uh, that did that work. So that's the guitar, and, and that guitar uh, used throughout the Indies' entire career. And we replicated the guitar, and uh, uh, well, there's Andy and Opie on the show, and there's the, the uh, Face of the Crowd poster with Pat Patricia Neal. And there's Andy in the show, very intense. If you haven't seen it, you gotta go, go get this. And there's Andy with Brownie McGee. He was, you know, Andy was a pretty good, pretty good player. And there's uh, Andy uh, on the set of Not Hop with the guitar. And there's Andy with, uh, with my recreation of, of his instrument. With Marty Stewart, and I get, I got postcard, postcards and uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas cards from Andy and his wife Cindy every year, and just unbelievable to work with somebody that is kind of woven into the fabric of your whole life. So uh, this is pretty special. So Marty Stewart was married to one of Johnny Cash's daughters. And uh, even though Marty got divorced from her, he stayed uh, with close friends with Johnny. And one day Marty called me up on the phone and said, I have a phone number for you, 615. And he gave me the phone number. I said, who am I calling? He said, you'll find out. And I called and I said, this is Dick Boat from Martin Guitar. And he said, well, this is John. And I said, John who? And he said, John Cash. I've been waiting my whole life for this phone call. <laughs> I said, I've been waiting my whole life to make it. <laughs> so, of course, of course, he's the man in black, and we, we uh, designed a, a beautiful black guitar together, and I delivered it to him at Telluride, and this, this photo was taken at Telluride. And he was magnificent. There he is with June, June Carter Cash in the background, and he loved the instrument, and he used it for the last five years of his life, and recorded uh, that breakthrough album. Really memorable. So uh, Marty, Marty was also uh, friends with Willie Nelson, and he did the same thing. He gave me another phone number, and he said, "I want you to call this." And I said, "I'm going to call him, and you'll find out." And he said, "Hello, this is Willie." And uh, so you know, Willie's got this guitar called Trigger. Trigger is uh, a guitar that he got in 1969, and you know, Willie's all in 1969. Uh, oh, there's some lovely boxing uh, with Larry Holmes. So, you know, uh, and there's Willie with Pooty, his bus driver. There's reasons why I'm showing you this. Um, and there's, I think I'll leave that up on the screen for a minute. <laughs> so, the deal was, I went down to, I went down to Philadelphia and I met Willie backstage. Um, and, um, Willie had finished the concert and there was like a 
150 women ready to get his autograph, and I waited. And, and you know, the idea was we wanted to replicate Willie's guitar, and uh, without all the wear and tear. If you look at pictures of Willie through the years, Willie was a very clean cut, coat and tie, short hair, kind of geek. And then gradually he turned into what he is today. And the guitar uh, kind of followed, uh, followed suit. He had everybody uh, right on it and he wore a hole through it and it's just hanging on by a thread. It's a great sounding guitar. So he loves the guitar and it's one of, like Lucille of B.B. King, it's one of the most famous instruments in existence. So I arranged to meet him. He was uh, sparring with uh, Larry Holmes, which I can't believe. His one little finger was not really out. And uh, uh, I went over to the Larry Holmes Commodore Inn in Easton, uh, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, where Willie's bus was parked. And uh, Pooty, the bus driver, who was six foot nine and talked in a very somewhat young voice. Said Mr. Willie is uh, sparring with Larry Holmes, and he gets, you go into the hotel office, and I'll come and get you. Yeah. So I waited for an hour, and Cody came and got Willie. Willie will see you now. And so I, I went out to the bus, and the doors opened, and the smoke came out, and uh, went on the bus. And that's pretty much exactly what the scene was on the bus. And, uh, Except that the joint was this long and it was shaped kind of like a Louisville slugger. And all of his bandmates, his sister and everybody, they all had they all had joints and, and you didn't need to have a joint in there and just and you closed his mouth for three weeks. So he said, Hi Dad. And, uh, and uh, don't get up tight. And uh, stuffed a joint in my mouth. Of course I didn't inhale. <laughs> he said, would you like to go, he's so smooth, would you like to go to sound check, to sound check on the bus, and, and off, off we went, it was a cloud of bus, and uh, we went across the bridge with the, through the toll gate, and Pootie rolls the window down, and the marijuana <laughs> pouring into the toll, the toll guy. <laughs> Somehow we got through that room exited into the circle of downtown Easton, which, on, which was, they were replacing it with brick and had it all under construction. And Pooty is up here driving, and he didn't see the sign down here that said no buses, because when a bus drove down there, the lane narrowed and the bus couldn't turn. So we got to the, the circle, and the bus was stuck, and 50 cars in back of us hung in their horns, and uh, we were in a bit of a bind, and uh, Willie's just there, <laughs> so, uh, a 22-year-old African-American policeman that doesn't know who Willie Nelson is is banging on the, on the door of the bus and demanding to come on, on board. And, and Pudi opens the door, steps out, closes the door, and says, uh, "This is a private country." <laughs> The policeman doesn't know what that means, and he's like, and I'm sitting with Willie, and we're looking at Woody out the window, and uh, the policeman clearly is smelling. The, so we go to the back, we go to the back of the bus, and he shows him the, the license plate that says home, the Texas home, and it, it, this is Willie's home, and you need a, you know, a search warrant. And after, after Pudi and him go back, to, back and forth for 20 minutes, writes out a $350 ticket and, and backs up all the cars and we back the bus up and turn up the alley and, and, and it's over. And so we go to sound check and then the concert and the mayor of Easton is sitting in the front row Willie tells the story, the mayor, mayor comes up on the stage and rips up the tickets.
uh, trigger. I just had it, it's, it's got a hole worn right through it. We, uh, we didn't replicate the holes all through it, even though people wanted that. And, uh, and there's me and Willie. Can you tell which one is Willie? <laughs> That was a pretty, pretty memorable experience. David Crosby, uh, uh, let's see, I just want to make sure I'm, oh, I'm getting to the You've got witching hour. So, David Crosby checked himself in to a rehab center. Uh, he was in, in very bad shape. And he, all he had was this guitar, this unusual 12 string guitar, and, uh, and a suitcase. And two weeks later, uh, he woke up and the suitcase and the guitar were stolen. And he was pretty upset because this was his favorite, his favorite instrument. It was a modified Martin guitar. And uh, a year and a half went by and he was back on the road with Crosby, Stills and Nash. And his, his wife was on the side of the stage and she looked out in the audience and she, she saw a guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt that she had given to David as a birthday present being warned by some guy in the front row. And they got the police and they got the guy. And they brought him backstage and they quizzed him and said, where did you get the shirt? And he said, oh, he, he bought it at a thrift shop or something. Well, they didn't really believe him. They took his, li his license. And uh, a week later, they did a, a search on the license and they found out that he was an orderly at the rehab center stuff had been stolen from. So Grand Nash got wind of this and, and David's 50th birthday was coming up and uh, Grand Nash got $3,000 out of the bank and two six foot nine booties to go with him and they went to this guy's house, knocked on the door and picked him up by the shirt and they said, you got a choice, you can tell us where the guitar is, we give you the money or you can have the shit beat out of you. And he, he made the right decision. <laughs> he went, I can't believe he had the guitar. He gave him the guitar, they gave him the money, and Graham brought it, brought it back to the birthday party for David, where Judy Collins and all of David's friends were there. And Graham said, well, hey Judy, would you tell uh, David that, that he should play one of your... And he even had a horse. So, uh, David said, well, I don't have my, I don't have my guitar. And they Tears went down his face. So that's that is uh, the story that's embedded in every replica of, of that instrument that we made. Well, we worked with uh, with Stephen. There's the guitar. Got a, a wooden chip on this. Uh, uh, we worked with Stephen on a number of projects. He's a piece of work. <laughs> Graham, Graham is solid gold, and uh, Dave is doing pretty good. Got his liver back, or someone else's. <laughs> so this is a fun story. You know, Joan was known for playing uh, a 1922 Martin guitar, a beautiful little what's called a parlor guitar, small body instrument, and she'd been playing it throughout her whole career, really. And uh, and I saw in a magazine a picture of her holding a Larrave guitar, and I couldn't understand what happened. So I called her office. And um, her assistant told me that um, she, Joan had been up uh, in Seattle, that uh, Lara Bay was up there. Uh, Lara Bay told her that her market guitar was worth more than a million dollars. She was crazy to travel around with it. And he had made a, co a copy of it for her. And uh, that she should put the market under the bed. So, you know, this was very upsetting to me. And so, Surprisingly, Joan called me the next day to tell me the story because she felt a little badly about it. And she said, well, you know, that uh, she loves her Martin, but it is really valuable. And there's a couple things, little pieces of the etching had fallen off and the frets needed some work. And I said, well, why don't you pack it up, insure it for what you think. And she insured it for a million dollars. And she had it sent by courier back to Nazareth. It arrived and I took it to the repair department and, and checked it out thoroughly. So they have these little inspection mirrors that they go inside to look at the braces and they're in, inside with the <coughs> little dental mirror and, and they're looking at the inside of the top. And uh, sometimes, you know, the Martin family would write the date or sign it or something, but it, 
Instead, it said in big black scrolling magic marker, too bad you're a communist. And, and, uh, and it was written backwards so that you could read it with the mirror. So it didn't make, make much sense, but the, the repair people were very worried that, that uh, they would be blamed. If she ever found out about this, they'd be blamed for putting this in there. And asked me if I would call her and tell her. So I called her and I said, Joan, are you sitting down? <laughs> and she said, well, now I am. And, and, and I, I told her that somebody has written too bad you're a communist on the inside of your guitar. It was a dead silence for 15 seconds. And then she broke out laughing and she thought it was the most funny, hilarious, pertinent thing that she'd ever heard. So she figured that, uh, you know, we were just talking about David Harris. Is that right? Yes. The Joan went through a, 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 time, a time period of pretty intense, well, she's still in that time period, but pretty intense political activism. And she had taken her guitar in to a repair shop where there was somebody that she described to me as a redneck that um, most likely had put that little message in there for her. She loved it. And as we were working on the prototypes, is that Hollis? Sorry, yeah. Hollis. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> so as we, were, as we were working on the prototype for the guitar, I, I woke up in a sweat in the middle of the night and I, and I got to put that in the so we made a little label backwards that said, too bad you're a communist. And uh, stuck it up underneath every guitar. And, and in the guitar case, we put a little inspection mirror, but we didn't give anybody any other information. And at every concert, Joan would get to the song, Diamonds and Rust, and tell, and tell this whole story. And it's just, you know, every guitar has a story inside of it. Oh, what did they do? And there's Bob Dylan playing Jones on the guitar. And it's me and Joan in Philadelphia. Still had a little brown hair left. Joan uh, doesn't have much brown hair left. But she's a beautiful woman and she's really the matriarch of She's uh, on her final tour, like Paul Simon and, and uh, Eric. Eric Clapton. A lot of, a lot of the uh, heroes, musical heroes of our youth are finishing up. So I think I'll finish with this story. It, it is 3.51. So Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits, arguably my favorite uh, guitar player. And uh, he, he didn't become famous as a young man, as a very young man. You get, if you're famous by the time you're 18, you're usually pretty obnoxious by the time you're 50. He's a real, he's a gentleman. He, he, uh, he was an English teacher and uh, uh, just a magnificent guitar player. He was playing with a pick with his band and he dropped his pick and fell into the audience and he reached and he didn't have another one. And so he had to turn the volume up and play with his fingertips and afterwards everybody said, how did you get that sound? And he said, well, I was just playing with my fingers. He said, this, it sounds fantastic. And that kind of defines his style. So um, I was so honored to be working with him on the design of his guitar. Uh, we, we kind of settled on what he wanted. But while I was working on the prototypes, this little article appeared in the, in the London Times. Uh, so what had, what had happened is uh, in Madagascar, a group of paleontologists were digging and they, they weren't finding anything. And, it, and they, said they had a boom box and they put sultans of swing on and they found a femur. And they, and they said, well, that's pretty cool. And they kept digging and they dug for two more weeks. They didn't find anything and somebody said, well, maybe we should put sultans of swing back on, which they did. And they found the whole skeleton of a species of dinosaur that had never been discovered before. So if you discover a species that doesn't exist, you're allowed to name it. And they named it Masia Casaurus Nothleria. Um, so I know this is perfect. This is the type of thing that I live for. So, so I uh, 
uh, digitize the little, oh, I guess I don't have that picture. I digitized the little dinosaur side view into a pearl inlay, and I made a sample up and photographed it, and I emailed it over to him. And then I called him on the phone, and he said, I've had quite enough of this dinosaur business. <laughs> so apparently all of his friends were written constantly about the dinosaur, and it's very disappointing to me because I'd like to have a book for, for the instrument and, and the story. So I was, I was pretty disappointed, but I completed the prototyping, and I, I had fl flew over to uh, London to meet with him, and he's such a gentleman. And arrived, you know, Night flight arriving at 7 in the morning. I was at his studio by 9 in the morning. And he's in there with Emily Lou Harris reporting. And, and he stops the recording and he says, Would you like a cup of tea? And he brings the table and puts it be between me and Emily Lou and brings me a chair. And he says, Would you like lemon or milk? And he's serving me tea. And that's just the kind of person he is. And afterwards, uh, he said, Why don't you go down and have some lunch? I'll be down in a minute. Came down and he says, Do you mind if I sit with you? <laughs> Went through all the specs, got to the very end. I said, I know you don't like this dinosaur thing, but I have an idea. Instead of putting it on the headstock or the fingerboard, what do you say we laser burn it on the front block inside the guitar and make everybody hunt for it just like the paleontologists? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so that's what we did. And, and usually we put the artist's name on, on the front block, and, and instead of putting Mark Knopfler, we put Master Carrius and the And uh, there's Mark. That's the actual guitar. Oh, and there's the, there's the little curl and lay. So, can I finish quickly by telling you that, yeah, I have five minutes. So, uh, Mamas and Papas, actually, I mentioned last night that when I had my clandestine record player, and do you understand, you could, you could take your second drawer and turn it upside down, as long as you turn the handles upside down too, so that so that Toby Sint couldn't tell what he was We would play uh, Mamas and Papas and Aftermath. We the first stereo albums when we were playing. And Mamas and Papas, uh, 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 John Phillips there with a, with a Martin, in fact, all four of them had Martin guitars. Uh, so I was really pretty excited about uh, doing this. And one of the reasons is, uh, when I got my driver's license, uh, while I was at Blair, I got my driver's license, and that summer, I, I called my girlfriend up um, and uh, picked her up in my car and went to the airport parking. You know, remember what parking was? My daughter doesn't even know what parking is. <laughs> so, went parking, and we were, I was rounding first base, and uh, <laughs> turned the radio on, and it was, Monday, Monday, for the first time I heard, heard it, and I was coming around second, and uh, I, I never forgot the connection between that first, so it was pretty special for me, and of course every male in the entire world was completely in love with Michelle Phillips, she just got it gorgeous, so in introducing the, uh, the guitar out in California at the music show, by the way, it's Mama Cass's daughter, on the left, and John Phillips' his son on the right uh, with the guitar, and that's Michelle. And we were doing a press conference for all the television stations, and, uh, and I told the story about my first kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and she turned to me and she planted one, she planted one on me, and she said, and you won't forget that one either. <laughs> <laughs>
somewhat gregarious, outgoing personality into a 42-year-old, 42-year uh, dream job. So, thanks.